Hey guys, welcome to the final lecture in the pediatric section. This one's gonna focus on child abuse. Now, as mandatory reporters of suspected child abuse, it's really important that you can recognize some of the red flags, some of the signs and symptoms of the different types of child abuse. And so that's what we're gonna go through in this lecture. So let's go over some red flags in your caretaker history for physical injuries. So some signs of potential abuse include a history that doesn't correlate to the degree or kind of injury. So for example, they claim that a pet bit a child, but the typical bite patterns or the puncture marks that you would expect to see aren't there. The caretaker may deny any history of trauma despite the presence of physical injury or injuries. They may also change the history when they're questioned. For example, first claiming that a child fell, then when asked about a finding that clearly doesn't match with the fall injury, changing the story and saying something entirely different. Now, if the observers or caretakers are questioned separately, they may have two different stories as to how the injury arose. That's obviously a major concern, a major red flag. Injuries may also be blamed on other young children, pets, or the patient themselves when the injury is unlikely given the extent or type of injury. A deep third degree burn, for example, is unlikely if the child was in brief contact with a hot ob object. Anything that strikes you as odd or unlikely, you always want to explore further. Now, signs of abuse can include various forms of bruising, including any, including any bruising in infants under six months who aren't even mobile. Okay, if they can't move, this, of course, is very suspicious. Human bite marks appearing as two rows of box-shaped semilunar bruises are also another intentional sign of child abuse. Pattern bruises, either from a slap, a belt, or an object like a wooden spoon, might also be seen. You really want to be able to recognize bruising in unlikely places when the child is mobile. So for example, a mobile child would likely have bruises on their legs or their arms because they're falling all the time. But bruises on areas like the ears, uh, the buttocks, the neck, the torso, these would be a concern. Now one condition you want to be aware of that can present shortly after birth and look similar to bruising are Mongolian spots. These are sort of blue-gray skin lesions that are commonly located at the base of the spine and on the buttocks. Uh, additionally, alternative medical treatments like cupping can leave skin markings, but those would not be a form of child abuse. Next up, let's look at bone fractures. These may be seen with physical child abuse. Now, on radiographs, patients with multiple fractures in different stages of healing should always raise concern for child abuse. Now, there aren't many reasons why a child would repeatedly be suffering from bone fractures, especially if they don't have a genetic condition like osteogenesis imperfecta, where fractures would occur more easily. However, if the child does present with blue sclera and hearing loss along with multiple fractures, then you want to explore osteogenesis imperfecta. The other location of fractures that could be associated with physical child abuse are rib fractures. These fractures can occur when a child is forcefully squeezed uh, by the chest or shaken violently at the torso. And because children's ribs are even more flexible than adults, it's even harder for them to fracture. Now, rib fractures can also be caused by a direct physical blow to the chest, either with a closed fist or with blunt objects. Skull fractures in children under 18 months of age without a reasonable history is another potential sign of child abuse, as are long bone fractures in infants. Finally, fractures located at the uh, metaphyseal corner or imaging showing epiphyseal separations would both be indications of potential child abuse. Next up, we are going to cover intentional burns that may be a sign of child abuse. Burns suspicious of being inflicted by a caregiver would include deep tissue, circular, 8 to 12 millimeter in diameter burns that would be consistent with cigarette burns. Immersion burns are also important to look out for. This is when a child is placed into and held in a scalding hot bathtub. So what you would see here are well-defined uh, upper lines where the burn ends and the normal skin begins. That would be the line where the, the demarcates the portion of the body that was above and below water. The children may also sometimes have um, an area underwater that is pressed against the bottom of the tub, and this is excluded from burning. So consider the buttocks. So there's the buttocks might not have the same degree of burn, but the area around it. So if they were, let's say, held down, the burning would occur around that area. Something important to keep in mind. Now, this is probably deep diving into specifics, but you always want to be on the lookout for this. Other signs of intentional burns include burns with a clearly demarcated edge in the form of an object that might have been heated and then pressed against the child's skin. Physical signs of abuse of head trauma would include retinal hemorrhages. This is usually caused by physical abuse affecting multiple layers of the retina. There also tend to be different points of hemorrhage rather than just one to two retinal hemorrhages. 
as well as hemorrhages located throughout the retina, including the periphery of the retina. And these are all signs of potential abuse. Intracranial pathology can be identified using CT or MRI, and findings may include a subdural hemorrhage, focal cortical contusions, brain swelling, subarachnoid hemorrhage, as well as skull fractures. Now, next up, let's talk sexual abuse. Children with signs of sexual abuse can have injuries in the oral cavity, genitals, or anus. Now, signs of oral sexual abuse include frenulum tears and or bruising or petechia of the hard or soft palate. Signs of sexual abuse involving the child's genitalia might include erythema, tears, or abrasions um, of the labia, the introitus, and or the hymen. Now, the hymen may also be absent due to trauma, and vaginal discharge may be present if the patient has a sexually transmitted infection. In male patients, there may be evidence of erythema, abrasions, or bruising. And in either patient, male or female, there may be evidence of anal penetration, including an anus, which is edematous and has a blue discoloration. There may also be lacerations of the rectum. Now, appropriate STI testing should be performed to identify any infections, and that can help you guide treatment. Now, to support criminal prosecution of sexual assailants, there should be photo documentation of physical signs of abuse, as well as detailed medical notes that are documented in the patient's chart. Swabs should also be used to collect semen samples if present, and if the victim endorses scratching, the assailant's fingernail scrapings should also be looked at. The treatment of children who have been sexually abused would include treating prepubertal children who have an, a positive SCI test with the appropriate antibiotics, as well as all postpubertal children who have been sexually abused, regardless of STI results. Cultures and samples should be obtained prior to giving antibiotics. Uh, postpubertal female patients sh should also be offered um, emergency contraception to prevent pregnancy. Patients and the patient's family should also receive a referral for a mental health evaluation with a psychologist who specializes in treating children and families of children who are victims of sexual abuse. Now, physicians in the United States are mandatory reporters of child abuse, and as such, they must report all suspected cases to the police department, and if the caregivers are involved in the sexual abuse, either directly or indirectly, then a child welfare agency such as Child Protective Services should be contacted. Most cases, something important to keep in mind, most cases of sexual abuse are perpetrated by an individual who's known to the child. And if the sexual abuse was due to either inadequate parental supervision or the assailant is a family member, child protective services should be involved. Let's finish up here with Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Now, in this condition, a child is receiving medical care guided by the deception of a caregiver, which can result in harm. Now, actions which the caretaker can take include an exaggeration of symptoms. Typically, the symptoms are present, but they're just exaggerated. This isn't always pathological, and it's not uncommon for caretakers to exaggerate to try and get the physician to really take the child's illness seriously. So this is really going to constitute a persistent exaggeration, especially when it's causing the patient to receive unnecessary care. A child should not be subjected to procedures or treatments and their associated risks based solely on the exaggerated history given by a caretaker. Caretakers may just simply fabricate symptoms, and there are several ways in which a caretaker can fabricate symptoms. One way is to alter medical records. So in this scenario, they may provide the clinician with printouts of medical records that they've altered. Another way is simply by providing false past medical history. They may also uh, try to alter lab studies. For example, adding blood to the urine or stool samples to make it appear as though the patient has a condition with hematuria or hematochesia. And finally, and potentially the most severe action that the caretaker may take is intentionally causing illness to the child. So they may drug a patient with medications, cause rashes by rubbing chemicals or caustic agents on the skin, inject feces or other materials into an IV line while the patient's hospitalized, or if they have a PICC line at home, things like that. Now, when, a pa when, 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 you, when you, the physician, suspects Munchausen syndrome by proxy, you want to stop all unnecessary medications and or procedures and remove any unnecessary vascular access. You want to notify Child Protective Services, and then you want to consult with a child abuse specialist. All right, let's finish this one up with some content review questions. Question number one, 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button. Correct answer here is B. Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back.
correct answer here is A. Last question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you've got it, come on back. Correct answer here is D. All right, guys, that is the end of this lecture. That is the end of PEDS. I will see you in the next topic. Thank you.